Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. We have the honor of having with us here today, Joyce Mitchell, a truly esteemed arbitrator, mediator, and attorney internationally. She's been on Zoom connections with people all over the world today alone. Sandra Sims, one of our retired judges and author, and just an incredibly strong contributor to the community in so many ways. And Louise Ng, not only an outstanding, outstanding attorney, but one of the women's rights leaders professionally and personally in Hawaii for many, many years, more than you would think looking at her young face. So today we're gonna to take on just some easy stuff. We know we're coming out of a time, hopefully coming out and not staying in, a time of extreme chaos, high risk, high tension, high stress. Where are we? Where do we need to go? How can we get there and what might that look like? Joyce, Sandra, Louise. Ooh, feels like we're coming out of a storm and there, there's, there's, there, the sun is, is peeking through the clouds and it's about to be a bright sunny day and then another cloud comes over, there's a little bit more rain and then it opens up again but we're still feeling in that place of, of, of hopefulness that the sun is coming out. That's kind of how I'm feeling at this point, that the sun is coming out. Obviously, it's not going to be it's like the perfect day, but we've got more sun than we had at another time. And that feels good. Um, feels better, certainly. Um, that's why I'm like this morning, I suppose. What do you guys no, and that's spot on, Sandra. I mean, and these are not just rains. These are Mississippi floods. These, these, are, these hurricanes. are these are hurricanes, Chuck. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these, are, these are hurricanes. <laughs> I feel so much better about the openness that I think we're going to see uh, as time goes on. Uh, I'm I'm sensing and feeling that the new cabinet will get a chance to get over their honeymoon. They will bring their expertise to bear, and we will be able to tell them what we think we need. But you know what I think most of all is going to be great for us is with all the technology we have now and the people that we've seen here, we're going to get a chance to touch each other again and see each other as humans. And it's going to be a great model for our kids because we're going to learn something that our kids um, felt while they were sequestered. And those of us who've moved through many, many channels to get where we are know that sometimes the basic foundations that we got years ago have led us. We go back to them sometimes depend on. Maybe we might find ourselves, how do I say, uh, bonding more with the younger generation because they really will need us to help understand some of those interpersonal things that are happening with them that they've been missing. And we need them for the technology to be able to survive in this world. Yes, 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 yes. Louise, what's your take? Well, um, well said, everybody. Um, I certainly relate to that feeling of a, emerging from a storm. I have to say that almost on a daily basis, I am still grateful that when they refer to President of the United States, it is Joe Biden. And it is a competent president who has the interests of the country in mind and unity and competence and social justice, um, you know, and getting things done in a competent, um, efficient, principled way. So I am really happy about that. And although, of course, we can't treat our, our youth and the next generation as a monolith, they all have different views, I see so much help, too, in um, our next generation what they've been through, their their social conscience. So um, I, I think as as our population ages and we get ready for the next generation, um, as you say, Joyce, we need to focus our efforts and work together with them to make this a better place. I, I think the president. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chuck. No, no. I think the president and the vice president are going to be great models for our kids. I think there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen oh. for the next couple mm. of years. Oh. And that's gonna be the difficult part. How do we unlearn something 
when uh, they were over the last four years uh, uh, bombarded with things that they were perhaps told prior to then should not happen between us. So the unlearning is going to be necessary. And I am looking forward to spending time with my grandchildren to work through that. Uh, and as Louise says, to have the two competent leaders there, two people who worked in the Senate and one who has served under, let's see, he served under one uh, president and he's been in this, he was in the Senate for many, many years. So he understands the workings of government, the legislature, uh, and he understands the the importance of negotiation and and i think that's going to work very well for him and thanks joyce and all of you for kind of grounding us in a couple of things one is that we have been given our humanity back we've been encouraged to not only manifest it but to share it to connect with each other through it to support each other with it. And a few weeks, no, months before the election, Brian Schatz, our state senator, really good guy, also my daughter's high school classmate. So I get to have a US senator to call me Uncle Chuck. So that's not. So I'm asking Brian, this is months before the election. He said, and I said, so what do you think? What are the chances? And he said, Chuck, I'll tell you three things about Joe Biden. Number one, he's been there for 40 years. Everybody knows him. You will never hear a single person in Congress say a bad word about Joe personally. They'll accuse him of being liberal, progressive, communist, whatever, the political rhetoric. Personally, not a bad word from anyone. Not Mitch, not any of them. Second, he said, he is a team leader. Every issue he targets, every decision that evolves comes from a team of people who are the cream of the cream. They are the scientist scientists. In climate change, his team is better than Bill Gates' team. And look at how much money Bill has to bring his team together with. Yes. In education, his wife and the team that she is putting together and helping him put together, they're incomparable in healthcare. When he named his team, the healthcare scientific professionals in this country applauded. They were elated. That tells you in the people who know the most about the areas that have the worst problems and the most harmful effects on those who are marginalized and underserved, mm -hmm. he has the people who know how to approach those and heal those for the benefit of the people least served. He said, one more thing. I know, he said, Joe Biden, I will tell you, Chuck, he has suffered, he has lost family members, he has gone through things that none of us can imagine personally, and he is a decent human being. Mm -hmm. The scene of him reaching out to the little boy with a speech impediment, yeah. he said, that's Joe Biden. That's mm -hmm. Biden. Yes. We have been given back the choice to be human beings with exactly. and for each other. Mm -hmm. Joyce, mm -hmm. Sandra, Louise, you are spot on. Yeah. It is a gift that is incomparable. How do we make it long term? How do we systematize it? How do we bring it where it needs is needed most? I think we're starting to see that in communities. Uh, I, you stress a good point about uh, his humanity, which come from having having lived life and suffered things that people they put people go through, and understanding what that feels like, and empathizing with the things that those things that occur in in in, in life, including serious loss, and so that does make you see and relate to people in a different way. So when we come to our communities, I think that encourages people who are engaged in community and community activities to understand that that is now that that's value. I don't think that we really value that sort of humanity, that sort of compassion and caring, you know, for one another. That we almost I won't say we lost it, but 
it was certainly not something that we saw in leadership mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the last few years. Uh, but I think that's an important component that's, that's returning and making our community and our community organizations and our community leaders be more effective as well. And then, like you said, Joyce, reaching out to those, to that younger generation, to those grandchildren, when they're able to see that again, mm -hmm. you know, that that is going to help you because you got to start there. You got to start with having some sense of empathy and humanity and have compassion mm -hmm. for your neighbors. It starts there, and when you, and if you lose that, then you just kind of you're lost. Um, but when you have that, then it helps you to be able to you know, focus and do other things and be and, and, and do better for your community. When you when you see leadership care, when you see, I mean, that's one of the things that we used to see with, with the Obamas, you know, going to the shelters and going to places where you were one-on-one -on -one helping people and people understood that. That really helps. It's necessary uh, to teach our children um, how to be better citizens. You start there because you got to care. Yeah, you know, uh, I just recently decided to get active again with my sorority that's involved in community activities and chats. I think that's one way we we help this process along because whereas the president and the vice president have a role to play, our role is, I believe, the, the talking, the listening, the hearing of what happened because sometimes just hearing how people feel and what they've been thinking and what they'd like to see as their future. It's going to make a difference in the lives of many. So how else can I do that except to, I, I, I like to work through organizations that are involved in, in, in things that I can participate with. Because last night I heard that one organization had put together some Black History Month uh, books, et cetera, for groups, and they couldn't get children to uh, take them. I said, well, you've got to realize there are a lot of things that are happening to the parents right now. They don't want you to bring books and gifts to their children right now. We can't touch each, each other. But if you have the intent and the desire and the belief that there will be a time when you can do that, it's going to happen. It'll happen. And, they, and we can be successful. So I told them that I'd like to be successful. And in the meantime, they can give me some of those books and things for my grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's a point that cannot be overvalued, Joyce, because if we break it down into the human connections, maybe it doesn't need to be a book, but maybe sharing stories like you and I did a few days ago, as Sandra and I have done, and Louise and I in the past. Stories connect people. They're personal, they're human, and they promote mutual respect and understanding. So maybe exactly as you point out, maybe our most valuable role here is to rebuild from the ground up our connections with each other, our human connections, our connections of respect and understanding and kindness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in some ways, uh, the, I like to think of the silver linings that came out of 2020. And one is technology, um, more Zoom, you know, virtual meeting platform. But I think that has helped us um, maintain or keep a connection while during the times that we cannot keep physically connected. And I want to give a shout out to Sandra. We just discussed this a little before this show started about her role in this multidisciplinary approach to just teaching about racial and social justice, which is this joint effort of the Judiciary, the Bar Association, and the Judiciary History Center in February, January, February, to educate about racial justice issues. Um, I thought that the, I loved the first session about Black Lives Matter and its impact in Hawaii and what is, you know, how the issues manifest themselves in Hawaii. Um, and it reminded me actually of something I heard from my law school friend who's a law school professor. And uh, he had a book reception la last night and most of his reading, writing, I don't, it's way above me. But there were three words he talked about that is sort of the purpose of his writing, which is, you know, that in America, we tend to have a willed forgetting of our history that takes us, prevents us from seeing the context. So we need to realize we have that and then do, you know, kind of remember 
um, go back to what the history is and learn from that and then prevention. If we understand history, then we can prevent. And I see what you're doing, Sandra, with that judiciary, the project of, you know, it's kind of reminding us of the historical roots of many of our biases and then what we need to do. How do you take the teaching to the next level, which goes into systemic and cultural change? The big questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how do we take that? How do we offer it in human, personal, connective way to the people in the communities who have been marginalized, excluded, underserved? We know who they are. We know where they are. And we need to get them vaccinations, but we need to get them shared humanity. We need to bring them not just to the table, but into the living room, into the dining room, to sit down and to be human connections that have meaning and value in our lives. Uh -huh. How do we do that? that? One of the things that, that um, was mentioned about the program, I, I can't take credit for, for doing the I've just been involved in the process, but what it also takes is leadership in those institutions that we value. The leadership in those institutions has to kind of set the tone and set the pace for how we address those issues. And one of the great things about the program that we've gotten involved with the is the judiciary and the Bar Association and the History Center is the leadership within the judiciary, our chief justice who's kind of really just taken the lead and you need to see that coming out in our institutions. You we're seeing it now on, on the national level where you someone has to step forward and say, this is the standard. This is what we're going to be pursuing, whether it's in the area of science, paying attention to the science for COVID, paying attention to the racial disparities when it comes to the distribution of health, um, health, health, of health procedures for disadvantaged communities when it comes to racial equity. There has to be this leadership that takes us to that place where our communities feel engaged, feel that what they're doing is gonna be effective and that they can connect with one another. So, you know, I mean, Louise has been a part of that program as well. We're gonna be coming up in a few weeks talking about implicit bias and, and what that looks like and, and how we do that. And, and how we can get people to recognize that and how that then impacts how how we interact. So it's important to have, um, you know, leadership that understands the importance and necessity yes. of these things, as well as, you know, the community input um, that's going in. And, and it also includes, you know, involving our young people and making certain that they see us and understand what's taking place so they can step up as well. Um, when we talked about the Black Lives Matter and Hawaii experience, the beauty of that was that was done by young people. And it was just astounding. Mm -hmm. You know, they took the lead in that. And that was just, it was very we have, And I apologize. We have a viewer question. And I don't want to get off okay. this track. I want to come back to it. But the viewer question on a different track is, historically, Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, uh, saying that he felt it was necessary in order to try to unite the country at a divisive time. There are people now who are claiming that impeaching former President Trump will only divide the country. What do those people need to hear and understand? I don't know if there's anything we can say <laughs> to help them understand. I feel like it's you know, um, maybe, or, or maybe we're, we're speaking to the rest of the populace who, who is open, but I, I just think that, um, you know, there needs, what I've heard from the impeachment team, is that there needs to be accountability exactly. before you can unite. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's my we know opinion. that in our families, don't we? Is that she, people she, have to take responsibility for the acts that they've done and it helps you to be uh, feel respected and appreciated once they once they acknowledge what they've done. That's how you move forward with individuals, I believe. Absolutely. And what you've just pointed out is absolutely critically important to both personal 
and civic responsibility. How can we claim to be models or to have a leadership model for our children, for those who follow, if those in power can abuse it in that way, that destructively, that divisively, that harmfully, that we've now seen how close they came to Vice President Pence, how close they came to Speaker of the House Pelosi, how vicious and dangerous the stated yelled intentions of those people were, how many months they put into it, how much money had gone into it, how much work and communications, and how aware of it the forces that might have been able to thwart them were, and the leadership of those forces essentially blocked them from acting. They were not prepared, they did not respond, and they called for help and they didn't get it until it was too late. So, yeah, I think that those principles that um, you know Eric had talked about go feed in right there on the will to forgetting, remembering prevention. If we just let it pass, people are not gonna remember it. And they're gonna, not only that, we won't learn all the details. We need to come have a reckoning of what actually happened, how dangerous it is, and then figure out where we go from there in terms of not just security prevention, but how do you bring people along? I have a, I have a sense that there've been some studies done on what the profile of the uh, insurrectionists were. Seems to be a lot of sense of, um, I, you know, it, maybe if not entitlement, that, that they didn't get what they expected. Um, economic dislocation. And it, uh -huh. it seems to me that uh, much of that has, you know, the, the remedy, part of that needs to be improving, people feeling like they've improved their place in life. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is true. It, it, it reminded me of, when you talk about, you know, whether accountability, I think you can't have the unity until you've got the accountability. You just don't get to do this and walk away. Um, you know, when I was on the bench and I, I did, did criminal cases and it, oftentimes you get a situation where, you know, a defendant is saying, you know, I, I'm, you know, at the time of sentencing, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry for my, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I did this. That's it. Well, no, there's a consequence. Um, your, your apology is accepted. I think you understand now what you've done, that it is wrong, but there is a consequence and that has to be addressed as equally as well as your acknowledgement. So now you can take your, you know, your apology and the consequence, the sentence that goes along with it. And when that is completed, then you begin this new life, this new perspective. If you've got to serve jail time, you do the jail time when you come out and then you begin. But there has to be, you know, we don't let criminals just walk in and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do that. And we go, oh, that's okay, then just go away. No, and no, so, have, you know. So is what we're talking about here, not just accountability, but prevention, protection? Absolutely. Because yeah, back to we it. know, we know this person and this group of supporters has told us they will be back. They're coming back March 6th. They're coming back in 2024. They're coming back in 2022. Mm -hmm. And they will be more organized. They will be more strategically planned. They will be more funded and resourced. And they'll be more dangerous because they'll be more committed. But we also know we also know more about some of the issues that affect what what brought mm -hmm. them to that place. Now we know one person, but at the same time, we also have as a society need to maybe understand and and address the issues that are raised by this insurrection as well. I mean, we certainly we we're, we're beginning to address our marginalized communities. We're beginning to address the diversity that needs to to be addressed. We're, inclusion, we're needing to address that, and that is happening. But we need to also maybe look and see, you know, what are what are we saying to this group as well that makes them feel that. There's nothing so let, to accept burn it down. And that's just, that's not it yeah. either. So let me ask, ask you folks a question. If the leadership and the dominant factors in that attack group, the invasion group, were black. If They'd be dead. They, they yeah. wouldn't even be They'd in the capital. Be dead, okay? Yeah. <laughs> 
Our history, history says so that <laughs> Sandra is correct. You yeah, know yeah. what has happened when any any group uh, of of African Americans raised up, they were hung. All kinds of things happened to yeah, them. But these were establishment people in many many ways. They served in our military. They served also in uh, uh, in law enforcement in some ways. There's an attorney that was there. Um, these were people who were part of the society. But I just have to tell you one thing. I just wish I could figure out a way how to send them down to Mar-a-Lago to stay for a while. <laughs> I th think that I don't think they would be very welcome there because oh, their, yeah, 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 their yeah. leader did not see them, I believe, as real individuals that we would respect. That's what I find it. It's his lack of respect. I heard he was a germaphobe, but I'm also uh, mindful of the fact that he didn't think very much of the people who followed him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Indeed. so as we, go to, as we go to our last couple of minutes here, <clears throat> let me ask a harder question. If Trump were not an old, purportedly rich, white American with the evangelical, rural, undereducated support that he had. How would he be treated differently? Is there a racial and class component to this? Is he getting protected because he is the member of a member of a sector that has been protected by the intentionally unequal advocates in this country for hundreds of years? Is that where his protection is really coming from? Look at who it is. But he's not, he's, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, because he's not them either. Not really. He's not. He's, he's not the people who he leads on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, um, he's, he, I, I think our congresspersons, and if, I, if I'm hearing where you go, I think some of the senators are afraid of the violence that those people will do again to them. I, that, that's what I'm thinking here. I, I think when Sandra talked about how, how you have to bring people to, to some kind of first restitution as, or recognition and getting them to move on through education, I'm not sure it's all because he's a white male. He, he raised up some of some of that, uh, but there there are lots of lots of facets to this right now, and we have yeah. to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, not just one facet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So we're out of time for today, but that's a great place to leave off. Let's come back, and in the meantime, the next two weeks, let's think about what do we okay. most need to learn from this for ourselves, for our children, for their protection, for their welfare for their humanity. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been a Thank really you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And goodbye to those who listened in. Yes. Yeah. Hey, come back in two weeks. <laughs>